Wednesday, March twenty ninth, nineteen forty four. Dearest Kitty, Mister Bolkenstein, the Cabinet Minister, speaking on a Dutch broadcast from London, said that after the war a collection would be made of diaries and letters dealing with the war. Of course, everyone pounced on my diary. Just imagine how interesting it would be if I were to publish a novel about the secret annex. The title alone would make people think it was a detective story. Seriously, though, ten years after the war, people would find it very amusing to read how we lived, what we ate, and what we talked about as Jews in hiding. Although I tell you a great deal about our lives, you still know very little about us. How frightened the women are during air raids. Last Sunday, for instance, when 350 British planes dropped 550 tons of bombs on Amoden, so that the houses trembled like blades of grass in the wind, or how many epidemics are raging here? You know nothing of these matters, and it would take me all day to describe everything down to the last detail. People have to stand in line to buy vegetables and all kinds of goods. Doctors can't visit their patients since their cars and bikes are stolen the moment they turn their backs. Burglaries and thefts are so common that you ask yourself what suddenly gotten into the Dutch to make them so light-fingered. Little children, eight and eleven year olds, smash the windows of people's homes and steal whatever they can lay their hands on. People don't dare leave the house for even five minutes, since they're liable to come back and find all their belongings gone. Every day, the newspapers are filled with reward notices for the return of stolen typewriters, Persian rugs, electric clocks, fabrics, etc. The electric clocks on street corners are dismantled. Public phones are stripped down to the last wire. Morale among the Dutch can't be good. Everyone's hungry, except for the Azaz coffee. A week's food ration doesn't last two days. The invasion's long in coming. The men are being shipped off to Germany. The children are sick or undernourished. Everyone's wearing worn-out clothes and run-down shoes. A new sole costs seven fifty guilders on the black market. Besides, few shoemakers will do repairs, or if they do, you have to wait four months for your shoes, which might very well have disappeared in the meantime. One good thing has come out of this: as the food gets worse and the decrees more severe, the acts of sabotage against the authorities are increasing. The ration board, the police, the officials—they are all either helping their fellow citizens or denouncing them and sending them off to prison. Fortunately, only a small percentage of Dutch people are on the wrong side. Yours, Anne. Friday, March thirty-first, nineteen forty-four. Dearest Kitty, just imagine it's still fairly cold, and yet most people have been without coal for nearly a month. Sounds awful, doesn't it? There's a general mood of optimism about the Russian front because that's going great guns. I don't often write about the political situation, but I must tell you where the Russians are at the moment. They've reached the Polish border and the Prut River in Romania. They're close to Odessa, and they've surrounded Ternopil. Every night we're expecting an extra communique from Stalin. They're firing off so many salutes in Moscow. The city must be rumbling and shaking all day long. Whether they like to pretend the fighting's nearby or they simply don't have any other way to express their joy, I don't know. Hungary has been occupied by German troops. There are still a million Jews living there. They too are doomed. Nothing special is happening here. Today is Mr. Van Dan's birthday. He received two packets of tapako, one serving of coffee, which his wife had managed to save. Lemon punch from Mr. Kugler, sardines from Meep, eau de Cologne from us, lilacs, tulips, and last but not least, a cake with raspberry filling. Slightly gluey because of the poor quality of the flour and the lack of butter, but delicious anyway. All that talk about Peter and me has died down a bit. He's coming to pick me up tonight. Pretty nice of him, don't you think? Since he hates doing it, we're very good friends. We spend a lot of time together and talk about every imaginable subject. It's so nice not having to hold back when we come to a delicate topic, the way I would with other boys. For example, we were talking about blood, and somehow the conversation turned to menstruation, etc. He thinks we women are quite tough to be able to withstand the loss of blood, and that I am too. I wonder why. My life here has gotten better, much better. God has not forsaken me. And he never will. 
Yours and Frank. Saturday, April 1st, 1944. My dearest Kitty, and yet everything is still so difficult. You do know what I mean, don't you? I long so much for him to kiss me, but that kiss is taking its own sweet time. Does he still think of me as a friend? Don't I mean anything more? You and I both know that I'm strong, that I can carry most burdens alone. I've never been used to sharing my worries with anyone, and I've never clung to a mother, but I'd love to lay my head on his shoulder and just sit there quietly. I can't. I simply can't forget that dream of Peter's cheek, when everything was so good. Does he have the same longing? Is he just too shy to say he loves me? Why does he want me near him so much? Oh, why doesn't he say something? I've got to stop. I've got to be calm. I'll try to be strong again, and if I'm patient, the rest will follow. But, and this is the worst part, I seem to be chasing him. I'm always the one who has to go upstairs. He never comes to me. But that's because of the rooms, and he understands why I object. Oh, I'm sure he understands more than I think. Yours and Frank. Monday, April 3rd, 1944. My dearest Kitty, Contrary to my usual practice, I'm going to write you a detailed description of the food situation, since it's become a matter of some difficulty and importance, not only here in the Annex, but in all of Holland, all of Europe, and even beyond. In the 21 months we've lived here, we've been through a good many food cycles. You understand what that means in a moment. A food cycle is a period in which we have only one particular dish or type of vegetable to eat. For a long time we ate nothing but endive. Endive with sand, endive without sand, endive with mashed potatoes, endive and mashed potato casserole. Then it was spinach, followed by kohlrabi, salsify, cucumbers, tomatoes, sauerkraut, etc. It's not much fun when you have to eat, say, sauerkraut every day for lunch and dinner. But when you're hungry enough, you do a lot of things. Now, however, we're going through the most delightful period so far because there are no vegetables at all. Our weekly lunch menu consists of brown beans, split pea soup, potatoes with dumplings, potato kugel, and, by the grace of God, turnip greens or rotten carrots. And then it's back to brown beans. Because of the bread shortage, we eat potatoes at every meal, starting with breakfast, but then we fry them a little. To make soup, we use brown beans, navy beans, potatoes, packages of vegetable soup, packages of chicken soup, and packages of bean soup. There are brown beans in everything, including the bread. For dinner, we always have potatoes with imitation gravy, and thank goodness we've still got it beet salad. I must tell you about the dumplings. We make them with government issue flour, water, and yeast. They're so gluey and tough that it feels as if you had rocks in your stomach. But oh well. The high point is our weekly slice of liverwurst and a jam on our unbuttered bread. But we're still alive, and much of the time it still tastes good too. Yours and Frank. Wednesday, April 5th, 1944. My dearest Kitty, for a long time now, I didn't know why I was bothering to do any schoolwork. The end of the war still seemed so far away, so unreal, like a fairy tale. If the war isn't over by September, I won't go back to school, since I don't want to be two years behind. Peter filled my days, nothing but Peter, dreams and thoughts, until Saturday night, when I felt so utterly miserable. Oh, it was awful. I held back my tears when I was with Peter, laughed uproariously with the Van Dans as we drank lemon punch and was cheerful and excited, but the minute I was alone, I knew I was going to cry my eyes out. I slid to the floor in my nightgown and began by saying my prayers, very fervently. Then I drew my knees to my chest, laid my head on my arms and cried, all huddled up on the bare floor. A loud sob brought me back down to earth and I choked back my tears since I didn't want anyone next door to hear me. Then I tried to pull myself together, saying over and over, I must, I must, I must. Stiff from sitting in such an unusual position, I fell back against the side of the bed and kept up my struggle until just before 10.30. When I climbed back into bed, it was over. And now it's really over. I finally realized that I must do my schoolwork to keep from being ignorant, to get on in life, to become a journalist, because that's what I want. I know I can write. A few of my stories are good. My descriptions of the secret annex are humorous. Much of my diary is vivid and alive. But 
it remains to be seen whether I really have talent. Eva's dream is my best fairy tale, and the odd thing is that I don't have the faintest idea where it came from. Parts of Kelly's life are also good, but as a whole, it's nothing special. I'm my best and harshest critic. I know what's good and what isn't. Unless you write yourself, you can't know how wonderful it is. I always used to bemoan the fact that I couldn't draw, but now I'm overjoyed that at least I can write. And if I don't have the talent to write books or newspaper articles, I can always write for myself. But I want to achieve more than that. I can't imagine having to live like Mother, Mrs. Van Dan, and all the women who go about their work and are then forgotten. I need to have something besides a husband and children to devote myself to. I don't want to have lived in vain like most people. I want to be useful or bring enjoyment to all people, even those I've never met. I want to go on living even after my death, and that's why I'm so grateful to God for having given me this gift, which I can use to develop myself and to express all that's inside me. When I write, I can shake off all my cares. My sorrow disappears. My spirits are revived. But and that's a big question: Will I ever be able to write something great? Will I ever become a journalist or a writer? I hope so. Oh, I hope so very much, because writing allows me to record everything, all my thoughts, ideals, and fantasies. I haven't worked on Kelly's life for ages. In my mind, I've worked out exactly what happens next, but the story doesn't seem to be coming along very well. I might never finish it, and it will wind up in the waste paper basket or the stove. That's a horrible thought. But then I say to myself, at the age of fourteen and with so little experience, you can't write about philosophy. So onward and upward, with renewed spirits, it will all work out because I'm determined to write. Yours and Frank, Thursday, April sixth, nineteen forty-four. Dearest Kitty, you asked me what my hobbies and interests are, and I'd like to answer. But I'd better warn you, I have lots of them, so don't be surprised. First of all, writing. But I don't really think of that as a hobby. Number two, genealogical charts. I'm looking in every newspaper, book, and document I can find for the family trees of the French, German, Spanish, English, Austrian, Russian, Norwegian, and Dutch royal families. I've made great progress with many of them because for a long time I have been taking notes while reading biographies or history books. I even copy out many of the passages on history. So my third hobby is history, and Father's already bought me numerous books. I can hardly wait for the day when I'll be able to go to the public library and ferret out the information I need. Number four is Greek and Roman mythology. I have various books on this subject too. I can name the nine muses and the seven loves of Zeus. I have the wives of Hercules, etc. My other hobbies are movie stars and family photographs. I'm crazy about reading and books. I adore the history of the arts, especially when it concerns writers, poets, and painters. Musicians may come later. I love algebra, geometry, and mathematics. I enjoy all my other school subjects, but history is my favorite. Yours and Frank. Tuesday, April eleventh, nineteen forty-four. My dearest Kitty, my head's in a whirl. I really don't know where to begin. Thursday, everything was as usual. Friday afternoon we played Monopoly. Saturday afternoon too. The days passed very quickly. Around two o'clock on Saturday, heavy firing began. Machine guns, according to the men. For the rest, everything was quiet. Sunday afternoon, Peter came to see me at four thirty, and my invitation. At five fifteen, we went to the front attic where we stayed until six. There was a beautiful Mozart concert on the radio from six to seven fifteen. I especially enjoyed the Klein and Nach music. I can hardly bear to listen in the kitchen, since beautiful music stirs me to the very depths of my soul. Sunday evening, Peter couldn't take his bath because the wash tub was down in the office kitchen, filled with laundry. The two of us went to the front attic together, and in order to be able to sit comfortably, I took along the only cushion I could find in my room. We seated ourselves on a packing crate. Since both the crate and the cushion were very narrow, we were sitting quite close, leaning against two other crates. Moshi kept us company, so we weren't without a chaperone. Suddenly, at a quarter to nine, Mr. Van Dan whistled and asked if we had Mr. Dussel's cushion. We jumped up and went downstairs with the cushion, the cat, and Mr. Van Dan. This cushion was the source of much misery. 
Dusso was angry because I'd taken the one he uses as a pillow, and he was afraid it might be covered with fleas. He had the entire house in an uproar because of this one cushion. In revenge, Peter and I stuck two hard brushes in his bed, but had to take them out again when Dusso unexpectedly decided to go sit in his room. We had a really good laugh at this little intermezzo, but our fun was short-lived. At 9:30, Peter knocked gently on the door and asked Father to come upstairs and help him with a difficult English sentence. That sounds fishy, I said to Margaret. It's obviously a pretext. You can tell by the way the men are talking that there's been a break-in. I was right. The warehouse was being broken into at that very moment. Father, Mr. Van Den, and Peter were downstairs in a flash. Margaret, Mother, Mrs. Van Dee, and I waited. Four frightened women need to talk, so that's what we did until we heard a bang downstairs. After that, all was quiet. The clock struck quarter to ten. The colour had drained from our faces, but we remained calm, even though we were afraid. Where were the men? What was that bang? Were they fighting with the burglars? We were too scared to think. All we could do was wait. Ten o'clock. Footsteps on the stairs. Father, pale and nervous, came inside, followed by Mr. Van Dam. Lights out. Tiptoe upstairs. We're expecting the police. There wasn't time to be scared. The lights were switched off. I grabbed a jacket and we sat down upstairs. What happened? Tell us quickly. There was no one to tell us. The men had gone back downstairs. The four of them didn't come back up until ten past ten. Two of them kept watch at Peter's open window. The door to the landing was locked. The bookcase shut. We draped a sweater over our nightlight, and then they told us what had happened. Peter was on the landing when he heard two loud bangs. He went downstairs and saw that a large panel was missing from the left half of the warehouse door. He dashed upstairs, alerted the home guard, and the four of them went downstairs. When they entered the warehouse, the burglars were going about their business. Without thinking, Mr. Van Den yelled, "Police!" Hurried footsteps outside. The burglars had fled. The board was put back in the door so the police wouldn't notice the gap. But then a swift kick from outside sent it flying to the floor. The men were amazed at the burglar's audacity. Both Peter and Mr. Van Den felt a murderous rage come over them. Mr. Van Den slammed an axe against the floor, and all was quiet again. Once more, the panel was replaced, and once more, the attempt was foiled. Outside, a man and a woman shone a glaring flashlight through the opening, lighting up the entire warehouse. What the? Mumbled one of the men. But now their roles had been reversed. Instead of policemen, they were now burglars. All four of them raced upstairs. Dusso and Mr. Van Den snatched up Dusso's books. Peter opened the doors and windows in the kitchen and private office, hurled the phone to the ground, and the four of them finally ended up behind the bookcase. End of part one. In all probability, the man and woman with the flashlight had alerted the police. It was Sunday night, Easter Sunday. The next day, Easter Monday, the office was going to be closed, which meant we wouldn't be able to move around until Tuesday morning. Think of it, having to sit in such terror for a day or two nights. We thought of nothing but simply sat there in pitch darkness. In her fear, Mrs. Van D had switched off the lamp. We whispered, and every time we heard a creak, someone said "shh." It was ten thirty, then eleven. Not a sound. Father and Mr. Van Dan took turns coming upstairs to us. Then at eleven fifteen, a noise below. Up above, you could hear the whole family breathing. For the rest, no one moved a muscle. Footsteps in the house, the private office, the kitchen, then on the staircase. All sounds of breathing stopped. Eight hearts pounded. Footsteps on the stairs. Then a rattling at bookcase. This moment is indescribable. Now we're done for, I said, and I had visions of all fifteen of us being dragged away by the Gestapo that very night. More rattling at the bookcase. Twice. Then we heard a can fall. And the footsteps receded. We were out of danger so far. A shiver went through everyone's body. I heard several sets of teeth chattering. No one said a word. We stayed like this until eleven thirty. There were no more sounds in the house, but a light was shining on our landing, right in front of the bookcase. Was that because the police thought it looked so suspicious, or because they simply forgot? Was anyone going to come back and turn it off? We found our tongues again. There were no longer any people inside the building, but perhaps someone was standing guard outside. We then did three things: tried to guess what was going on, 
trembled with fear and went to the bathroom. Since the buckets were in the attic, all we had was Peter's metal waste paper basket. Mister Van Den went first, then Father, but Mother was too embarrassed. Father brought the waste basket to the next room, where Margaret, Missus Van Den, and I gratefully made use of it. Mother finally gave in. There was a great demand for paper, and luckily I had some in my pocket. The waste basket stank. Everything went on in a whisper, and we were exhausted. It was midnight. Lie down on the floor and go to sleep. Margaret and I were each given a pillow and a blanket. Margaret lay down near the food cupboard, and I made my bed between the table legs. The smell wasn't quite so bad when you were lying on the floor, but Mrs. Van Den quietly went and got some powdered bleach and draped a dish towel over the potty as a further precaution. Talk, whispers, fear, stench, farting, and people continually going to the bathroom, trying sleep through that. By two thirty, however, I was so tired I dozed off and didn't hear a thing until three thirty. I woke up when Mrs. Van D lay her head on my feet. For heaven's sake, give me something to put on. I said. I was handed some clothes, but don't ask what. A pair of wool slacks over my pajamas, a red sweater and a black skirt, white understockings and tattered knee socks. Mrs. Van D sat back down on a chair, and Mr. Van D lay down with his head on my feet. From three thirty onward, I was engrossed in thought and still shivering so much that Mr. Van Dan couldn't sleep. I was preparing myself for the return of the police. I tell them we were in hiding. If they were good people, we'd be safe, and if they were Nazi sympathizers, we could try to bribe them. We should hide the radio," moaned Mrs. Van D. "Sure, in the stove," answered Mr. Van D. "If they find us, they might as well find the radio." Then they'll also find Anne's diary," added Father. "So burn it," suggested the most terrified of the group. This and the police rattling on the bookcase were the moments when I was most afraid. Oh, not my diary! If my diary goes, I go too. Thank goodness, Father didn't say anything more. There's no point in recounting all the conversations. So much was said. I comforted Mrs. Van Dam, who was very frightened. We talked about escaping. Being interrogated by the Gestapo, phoning Mister Clayman, and being courageous, we must behave like soldiers, Missus Van Dan. If our time has come, well then, it will be for Queen and country, for freedom, truth, and justice, as they are always telling us on the radio. The only bad thing is that we'll drag the others down with us. After an hour, Mister Van Dan switched places with his wife again, and Father came and sat beside me. The men smoked one cigarette after another. An occasional sigh was heard. Somebody made another trip to the potty, and then everything began all over again. Four o'clock, five five thirty. I went and sat with Peter by his window and listened. So close we could feel each other's bodies trembling. We spoke a word or two from time to time and listened intently. Next door, they took down the blackout screen. They made a list of everything they were planning to tell Mister Clayman over the phone, because they intended to call him at seven and ask him to send someone over. They were taking a big chance, since the police guard at the door or in the warehouse might hear them calling. But there was an even greater risk that the police would return. I'm enclosing their list, but for the sake of clarity, I'll copy it here. Burglary, police in building. Up to bookcase, but no farther. Burglars apparently interrupted. Forced warehouse door. Fled through garden. Main entrance bolted. Kugler must have left through second door. Typewriter and adding machine safe in black chest in private office. Meeps or Babs laundry in washed up in kitchen. Only Bab or Kugler have key to second door. Lock may be broken. Try to warn Jan and get key. Look around office. Also feed cat. For the rest, everything went according to plan. Mr. Clayman was phoned. The poles were removed from the doors. The typewriter was put back in the chest. Then we all sat around the table again and waited for either Jan or the police. Peter had dropped off to sleep, and Mr. Van Den and I were lying on the floor when we heard loud footsteps below. I got up quietly. It's Jan. No, no, it's the police. They all said. There was a knocking at our bookcase. Meep whistled. This was too much for Mrs. Van Den, who sank limply in her chair, white as a sheet. If the tension had lasted another minute, she would have fainted. Jan and Meep came in and were met with a delightful scene. The table alone would have been worth a photograph, a copy of cinema and theater, open to a page of dancing girls and smeared with jam and pectin, which we'd been taking to combat diarrhea, 
two jam jars, half a bread roll, a quarter of a bread roll, pectin, mirror, a comb, matches, ashes, cigarettes, tobacco, an ashtray, books, a pair of underpants, a flashlight, Mrs. Van Den's comb, toilet paper, etc. Jan and Meep were of course greeted with shouts and tears. Jan nailed a pine wood board over the gap in the door and went off again with Meep to inform the police of the break-in. Meep had also found a note under the warehouse door from Sleekers, the night watchman, who had noticed the hole and alerted the police. Jan was also planning to see Sleekers. So we had half an hour in which to put the house and ourselves to rights. I've never seen such a transformation as in those 30 minutes. Margaret and I got the beds ready downstairs, went to the bathroom, brushed our teeth, washed our hands and combed our hair. Then I straightened up the room a bit and went back upstairs. The table had already been cleared, so we got some water, made coffee and tea, boiled the milk and set the table. Father and Peter emptied our improvised potties and rinsed them with warm water and powdered bleach. The largest one was filled to the brim and was so heavy they had a hard time lifting it. To make things worse, it was leaking so they had to put it in a bucket. At 11 o'clock, Jan was back and joined us at the table, and gradually everyone began to relax. Jan had the following story to tell. Mr. Sligas was asleep, but his wife told Jan that her husband had discovered the hole in the door while making his rounds. He called in the policeman, and the two of them searched the building. Mr. Sligas, in his capacity as night watchman, patrols the area every night on his bike, accompanied by his two dogs. His wife said he would come on Tuesday and tell Mr. Kugler the rest. No one at the police station seemed to know anything about the break-in, but they made a note to come first thing Tuesday morning to have a look. On the way back, Jan happened to run into Mr. Van Hoven, the man who supplies us with potatoes, and told him of the break-in. I know, Mr. Van Hoven calmly replied. Last night when my wife and I were walking past your building, I saw a gap in the door. My wife wanted to walk on, but I peeked inside with a flashlight, and that's when the burglars must have run off. To be on the safe side, I didn't call the police. I thought it wouldn't be wise in your case. I don't know anything, but I have my suspicions. Jan thanked him and went on. Mr. Van Hoven obviously suspects we're here, because he always delivers the potatoes at lunchtime. A decent man. It was one o'clock by the time Jan left, and we'd done the dishes. All eight of us went to bed. I woke up at quarter to three and saw that Mr. Dusso was already up. My face rumpled with sleep. I happened to run into Peter in the bathroom, just after he'd come downstairs. We agreed to meet in the office. I freshened up a bit and went down. After all this, do you still dare go to the front attic? He asked. I nodded, grabbed my pillow with a cloth wrap around it, and we went up together. The weather was gorgeous, and even though the air raid sirens soon began to wail, we stayed where we were. Peter put his arm around my shoulder, I put mine around his, and we sat quietly like this until four o'clock, when Margaret came to get us for coffee. We ate our bread, drank our lemonade and joked, and for the rest everything was back to normal. That evening I thanked Peter because he'd been the bravest of us all. None of us have ever been in such danger as we were that night. God was truly watching over us. Just think the police were right at the bookcase, the light was on, and still no one had discovered our hiding place. Now we're done for, I'd whispered at that moment, but once again we were spared. When the invasion comes and the bombs start falling, it will be every man for himself, but this time we feared for those good, innocent Christians who are helping us. We have been saved. Keep on saving us. That's all we can say. This instant has brought about a whole lot of changes. As of now, Dusso will be doing his work in the bathroom, and Peter will be patrolling the house between 8.30 and 9.30. Peter isn't allowed to open his window anymore, since one of the cat people noticed it was open. We can no longer flush the toilet after 9.30 at night. Mr. Sleegers has been hired as night watchman, and tonight a carpenter from the underground is coming to make a barricade out of our white frankfurt bedsteads. Debates are going on left and right in the annex. Mr. Kugler has reproached us for our carelessness. Jan also said we should never go downstairs. What we have to do now is find out whether Sleegers can be trusted, whether the dogs will bark if they hear someone behind the door, how to make the barricade, all sorts of things. We've been strongly reminded of the fact that we're Jews in chains, chained to one spot, without any rights, but with a thousand obligations. We must put our feelings aside. We must be brave and strong. Bear discomfort without complaint. Do whatever is in our power to trust in God. 
One day this terrible war will be over. The time will come when we'll be people again and not just Jews. Who has inflicted this on us? Who has set us apart from all the rest? Who has put us through such suffering? It's God who has made us the way we are, but it's also God who will lift us up again. In the eyes of the world, we're doomed. But if, after all this suffering, there are still Jews left, the Jewish people will be held up as an example. Who knows? Maybe our religion will teach the world and all the people in it about goodness. And that's the reason, the only reason, we have to suffer. We can never be just Dutch or just English or whatever. We will always be Jews as well. And we will have to keep on being Jews. But then we'll want to be. Be brave. Let's remember our duty and perform it without complaint. There will be a way out. God has never deserted our people. Through the ages, Jews have had to suffer. But through the ages, they've gone on living and the centuries of suffering have only made them stronger. The weak shall fall and the strong shall survive and not be defeated. That night, I really thought I was going to die. I waited for the police and I was ready for death, like a soldier on the battlefield. I'd gladly have given my life for my country. But now, now that I've been spared, my first wish after the war is to become a Dutch citizen. I love the Dutch. I love this country. I love the language and I want to work here. And even if I have to write to the Queen herself, I won't give up until I've reached my goal. I've becoming more and more independent of my parents. Young as I am, I face life with more courage and have a better and truer sense of justice than mother. I know what I want, I have a goal, I have opinions, a religion and love. If only I can be myself, I'll be satisfied. I know that I'm a woman, a woman with inner strength and a great deal of courage. If God lets me live, I'll achieve more than mother ever did. I'll make my voice heard, I'll go out into the world and work for mankind. I now know that courage and happiness are needed first. Yours and Frank.